Uh, I had uh, I have a little bit of an observation. Something occurred to me um, a few weeks ago. Um, I, I'm a bit of an amateur writer myself, and I like writing science fiction. And it occurred to me uh, that both Atlas Shrugged and Anthem are can be technically classified as dystopian science fiction. In both cases, you have uh, futuristic technology. Well, in the case of Anthem, it, it's truly dystopian. All of technology is broken down, culture, economy, uh, governance is all broken down to a medieval state. Uh, and you have a rediscovery of ancient technologies. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But in the case of Atlas Shrugged, um, you have uh, John Galt, who's invented these practically magical technologies that make possible, you know, they're plot devices that make possible the, the kind of revolution that is described in it. And it just, it was a, a huh moment when I realized that it's sci-fi, sci dystopian sci-fi, without the usual uh, hard leftism uh, of typical dystopian sci-fi. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's right. Although, I don't know what the definition of sci-fi is technically, so I, I'm not, you know, literature is not my field. And um, I, I'll uh, I'll just give a, a loose Atlas, definition. I'm not sure Atlas fits in the sense that it's usually placed in the future. Although I guess it doesn't have to be like like a um, what do you call it? A man in a high castle, which I only watched. I think the first season would be sci-fi, but it's not set in the future, so it's set in an alternative universe. So I guess it, yeah, go well, ahead. To to take a similar example, if you look at uh, A Scanner Darkly, uh, that was a really interesting film based on a Philip K. Dick uh, novel. Uh, obviously very dystopian in his uh, his thinking, but um, it's set, I, I think even the opening, uh, the opening explanation says, a few years from now. And it, it's meant to be very contemporary, but there are technologies that are very sinister and they're meant to be they could already exist now and you just don't know about it. Yeah, no, I think that, that, that makes sense. That's, I think that both, they both qualify. And, um, but I do, I, I, I do think quite a few, quite a bit of, maybe I'm wrong, but quite a, quite a bit of science fiction is kind of libertarian, free market. Um, Some is, um, not always. Not uh, always. I, I would it, say, right? I would say that most of the, the science fiction uh, that I've seen from the late 20th century and, in, uh, and into this century have been very, very left in orientation. They're, okay. they're, they are, in effect, utopian by virtue of their dystopian views. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they almost always present capitalists as the bad guys. I mean, Blade Runner is the quintessential example. Yep. I guess the, uh, I got stuck on... Uh... Robert Heinlein and never really went anywhere from there in my science fiction. Oh, he Heinlein wrote some really interesting stuff, and I, I you know, it's definitely worth uh, looking at. But, you know, it, it, for what it's worth, uh, I, I really love the ending, and I, I apologize. Cover your ears if, if you haven't gotten to the end of the um, uh, the uh, what's that series with the the young girl who's the archer in the uh, the arena? Uh, Hunger Games. Hunger yes, Games. Hunger Games, Hunger Games. The very end, close your ears if you don't want to hear this, but uh, in the end, uh, Katniss Everdeen realizes that the people who are presented as the good guys, the guys who are ousted, are really the, the flip side. They're communist Nazis versus the, uh, the overt uh, Nazis. And, and instead of killing the, the now captive Hitler of, uh, of her own uh, world, she chooses to kill the commie uh, Hitler. <laughs> so is that in the movie as well? Yes. Yes, oh. it is. I, I just I guess I don't remember. I watched the movies. I didn't see the uh, I didn't read the books. Oh, I think it puzzles a lot of people. Like, why didn't she kill Snow? Snow is obviously the bad guy. Why did she kill the leader of okay. District 13? Yeah. And the, the reason is simply she realized that that District 13 is just as bad as all the other, as the rest of Pan Am. Yep. All right, Jonathan. Tell me the value of selfishness. Use another word, self-esteem. The value of selfishness is that you esteem yourself as a value that you live according to your nature, which means by the judgment of your own mind and you respect your own mind, you respect your own ability to do the right thing. Therefore, you respect your, the possibility of being a morally virtuous person. And you regard yourself as a value 
worth preserving. Let me bring it down from Kant a little bit to a bromide that I had drummed into me as a child, and maybe you've heard it. Happiness comes from making other people happy. Oh, yes, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't heard it? And that's the trouble. Let's aim at the day when people will not hear it anymore. Because it isn't true, it isn't justifiable, and the first question you would have to ask is, why? Why is it good to want others to be happy, but not yourself? And I suppose you will be told that, well, but they will work for your happiness and not their own. Well, it's like an exchange of Christmas presents that neither party wants, but that you have to exchange presents and you're not allowed morally to do something for yourself. Whereas what I say, you can make others happy when and if those others mean something to you selfishly. If you love them, then you want to make them happy. Fine. If you don't love them, that's not a moral crime. You don't have to love everybody. You cannot love everybody because it's a meaningless expression. You can love only those whom you value. And if they contribute to your happiness, you contribute to theirs. That's fine. But each one of you has to be selfish about it. Supposing somebody were in love with you and said, can I, I can love you because you're so bad. <coughs> so I sacrifice myself and I'm going to love you. Would you accept that or no, would you say it's the most... No, sir, I wouldn't either. That's the most insulting thing anyone could have said to you. And yet that's what altruism would demand. And there is a great Russian writer who tried to practice it, Dostoevsky, who did marry a poor, uh, stupid little uh, seamstress who, whom he didn't love at all, out of the desire to make her happy. You see, The end of it was she committed suicide. Now that is an altruist practice. That's what altruism leads to. How about it's more blessed to give than to receive? Well, that's obviously the welfare state. That's a clearly motivated slogan. Uh, to please uh, give me something and you'll be blessed, but I will keep your, your material good. Using the Super Chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time so i'll do it again maybe we'll get some more today um if you like what you're hearing if you appreciate what i'm doing then i appreciate your support uh those of you who don't yet support the show please take this opportunity go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com your own book show and um and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going i'm not sure when the next